So, welcome also from my side. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to be here in Switzerland at the Swiss chapter of Incosi and um, to make the keynote. So, I apologize if I'm a little bit nervous. Typically, I'm used to do presentations, but a keynote for this uh, expert gremium is something which um, I appreciate a lot. So, in my keynote, I would like to span a little bit the the frame for this conference. So um, I tried to focus not too much on the company, on my company, not too much only on systems engineering, but to give you an overview how I think systems engineering is a binding link um, to solve the nowadays problems. I would like to go a little bit into what I think and what John Deere thinks is nowadays challenges to be solved and why a company has to change, has to modify itself to be able to foster that. Um, so my, oh, come on, oh, sorry. My, um, my presentation will start with a brief introduction of myself and the company. This should not be a marketing event. This should just frame a little bit for those who don't know John Deere, why I think it's a good example for a typical classical steel and iron company building heavy equipment and deciding to go the systems engineering way. Um, I will explain a little bit what I think are the challenges and why a holistic view is necessary. And then I will refer to Conway's law and to Steve Eppinger. Some of you may know those both um, and, and why they are unfortunately true and why it's important for a company to change to, to uh, adopt to that, uh, to that new trends. Um, I explain the organizational change a little bit and then I will show you some solutions resulting out of that. And obviously I will summarize it. Um, starting with the introduction, um, David introduced me already, but I thought about this as a systems engineering conference, and I would not let, like to let you know, go without at least seeing one model-based system uh, thing here. And I tried, I do my Vita as a, as a system model just to show you that even this is possible. And for those who are much better experts than me, I apologize. If you find a mistake, you can get it. Okay. So in, in, a, in a nutshell, I'm a family man. I'm driving motorcycle. I'm hiking. I'm in the GFSE. I'm pro step EVIP either. And um, yeah, doing a lot of stuff. And since the, the, the most important thing to me in the past half year is since last autumn, November, I'm grandfather. My daughter gave me a grandchild. So um, this is about me. Now the more important thing coming to John Deere. And again, this is just to frame a little bit that you have an idea about um, why is this change important and, and where does it come from? We are a worldwide company, about 75,000 employees. Um, numbers are not most actual coming out of our, our business report. So we have, an, um, we, we have uh, revenues of about $44 uh, billion. We have um, net income of about uh, $6 billion. So you see, we are able to earn money with what we do. We have, um, since 2019, a new CEO, and he was actually the guy doing the whole transformation. The interesting thing in here is for an American company with a, a more than 100 years history it's only the 10th ceo we have and the first three has been really family so obviously this company is much more european than you may think of um and and to give you that that um brief summary on where we come from and where we go to and i think this is interesting um as in the title of my presentation is steel and iron company so we started really with something very simple. I'm wondering if this is something more like an implementation or really a system. It is a plow. John Deere was a blacksmith and he uh, came over to the United States in the 1800s and in 1837, he faced that the farmers in the Midwest had really hard times to make that land arable. It's a very heavy, very healthy ground, but it's really hard to plow it through. The, the, the soil sticks at the wooden plows and he was a blacksmith coming from England, um, and, and uh, he found ways to build a metal plow um, polished enough that the soil could, could slip away, so it was much easier to make the ground arable. That was the foundation of our company. Maybe not really a system, but a starting point, and absolutely steel and iron. A blacksmith found this company. Okay, so And then we started, we joined the trend going to the... Um, to the uh, engines, to the motors, uh, first tractor in, in 1920. And in 1956, John Deere decided to go over to Europe and bought Lanz. Many of you may know the old Lanz tractors, the Bulldog. 
And that was a time point when John Deere became aware in, in Germany. So a lot of agricultural business. We also have constructions, not so familiar in, in Europe, but then in 2017, we decided that, that John Deere would like to go also with the construction business to Europe, and we bought Wirtgen Group, uh, which made us immediately the world market leader in road building equipment with Vögler and, and, and Wirtgen machines. If you, if you drive through Germany, for example, on the highways, typically at all that nasty uh, construction areas, you see our equipment. We are blocking you. So. More interesting, in 2017, we decided that the, that the times has changed significantly and it's not enough to build steel and iron machines. So what we did is we acquired um, startup companies in 2017 and, and, and later years, like dealing with artificial intelligence, with uh, big data, with autonomy. And uh, lately, we also bought an Austrian company, which is famous in battery manufacturing and charging structure. So you can see there was a strategy behind to adopt to all that new needs. So we are doing agricultural equipment, construction equipment, forestry equipment, uh, power systems, our own engines, and in the future also our own electric drives, um, intelligent solutions. That's an important thing. We not only build any more steel and iron, we build software, software solutions, sensors, actors, which belongs to that, but this is a very strong part of our business. In the act business, and I will refer later on in my examples um, to the act business in, in particular, we are what, what's called a full liner. We, we provide everything a farmer needs to operate a farming operation. We have tractors, we have combines, we have balers, uh, mowers, um, and again, special software and solutions and programs and services doing that job more efficient, more effective. Um, we are a global company acting worldwide. We drive 89 factories in, in 21 countries. So you see, we also have uh, multicultural employees. We have multicultural consumers and, and, and customers. And it's very important to speak their languages on both sides, the employees' languages and the customers' languages. And as my title is, from product to solution, this is a view on a product of John Deere. This is a product where I'm most familiar with uh, as I'm busy in the tractor environment. You see um, on the uh, left-hand side a picture of the tractor, and that is meanwhile a super complicated and complex system as such. We have, uh, we have an internal combustion engine, we have infinite variable transmissions in, we have hydraulics in, we, su we supply power to our implements. We have mechanical power, hydraulical power. We also have electrical power. Uh, we go into the 700 volt uh, um, uh, VR2 architecture to drive with really electrical drives, seating machines and all that. And uh, the right picture should visualize the important thing here is this is not only a complicated and complex system, this is also a working place. And it has to be a mixture, it has to accommodate, it has to provide comfort to the customer, but it also has to allow to manage and operate that complicated and complex system. So this is not only like in your car that if you feel comfortable, you like it, you have also to follow and fulfill all the requirements for a working place. You have to reduce vibration, you have to reduce noise, you have to isolate the operator against agents, against fertilizer spray and all that stuff. So this is all hidden in it and the operation has to be simple and easy to learn. And if one of you would like to have a really brain challenge, I can, I can suggest join a farmer and ask him to, to do an operation in the field. And if you come to the end of the field and you have to stop the operation, turn around the tractor and start the operation again the number of manipulations you have to do. Try that out once and you will have much more respect in front of the farmers. Okay, so um, why am I telling that? I would like to lead over to the core part of my presentation. And uh, I borrowed um, a an, an visual from the Fraunhofer IEM, which explains uh, model-based systems engineering. I like the combinations of triangles and, and circles here. And uh, you can read it from inside out, outside in as you want to. Um, I do it outside in, and I would say we have um, basically, I, I try to reduce it to three major challenges. We have major problems we have. One thing is population is constantly growing. And this is good. This is a good thing. Okay, we, we don't want to blame about that. So the second thing is 
uh, while feeding that world, while sheltering that world, that growing world, we have to protect the environment. If we continue doing like we do today, we are doomed. So this is no, no option. We have to better protect the environment. But obviously, the third challenge is we have to be profitable. Our customers have to be profitable. We have to be profitable. Otherwise, that will not work out. And systems engineering in the core can help you now, on one hand, to develop products and services fulfilling that partially conflicting needs. Um, it allows you to adopt to that modern technologies and, and, and modern trends like connectivity, automation, artificial uh, intelligence, big data manipulations. But this is not working without an enabling organization. If you if you want to be if you want to do all that, your organization most probably has to change. This should be basically the framing of my presentation. So now, what are the challenges I'm talking about? And as I mentioned already, the um, the uh, population is continuously growing. Um, there are different sources and there are different models and different predictions. And you may hear different numbers. Nobody can, can see the future. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball to look into that. This is taken from the United Nations. And if you have better numbers, don't blame me about that. I've just chosen them to visualize this. Um, this model behind it is explaining that we will have in 2050 above 9 billion people. And I think there's no doubt about that. That number could be realistic. Okay, so what does that mean? They want to be feed, they want to be sheltered, they want to consume stuff. And even our developing countries are developing. This is again, this is a good thing, which means that they change their consumer behavior. So with all that, um, we are polluting the world. We are, we, are, we are damaging, we are harming the, um, the climate, the environment. And also in here, there is no exact prediction possible, but there are a couple of different models available. And I don't want to debate about which model is true and wrong and all that. There are smarter guys than me having much more knowledge about that models. But what you see here, this is also from the United Nations out of the IPCC report, which is uh, publicly available. I can highly recommend to have a look into it. It's, it's frightening, but you should really have a look into it. What you see here, they, they made eight different scenarios. They made eight different predictions about global warming. And the interesting thing in here is none of that prediction is a good one, right? It, 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 none, none is a good one. We start at, at one degree uh, warming already. This is what, what's the situation right now. And none of that prediction is capable to roll it back. So this is, this is already done. There is something broken. However, there are, there are some scenarios which are really severe. All scenarios are bad, but some are more severe. There are um, uncertainties and threats on it. You can see that at the end of the day, I think we can summarize and agree here in this round that global warming, um, climate change is a severe thing and we have to do something. On the other hand, growing population is also a good thing and that goes somehow hand in hand, right? A third aspect with that I would like to highlight a little bit is water stress. Water stress, this planet is a blue planet, right? We have, we have so much water, but not fresh water. Fresh water is really a challenge. We have only very little fresh water. And if you think about, I'm not sure if one of you heard the last days, there was some, some uh, messages in the news that in Antarctica, a glacier uh, is melting down very, very severely. And there are now series out that it may lift the, the uh, water level by up to three meters is what I heard in radio news. Where I want to go to is if this freshwater glaciers are melting into the oceans, they become salt water. This fresh water is gone. And you need energy to take the salt out of that. The energy has to be greenhouse gas neutral. So you see you are in that circle captured. What you see in here, again, a model, a prediction, uncertainty linked to that, probability linked to that. But you see water is a challenge for the future. And it is nothing which is far away from Europe. So typically, we in Europe, we have some advantages. Uh, we are healthy. We are wealthy. Um, but this is something you see that also our neighbors like Italy and Spain um, will be affected significantly. And also France and Poland will, be, uh, um, will have some effects of that. And I think we also see some effects of that in Germany. I don't know how it is about Switzerland, but in Germany, we had, a, we had significant droughts in the past years. 
and you see that farmers are thinking about what can I do have I to, to, to drill, um, dwell a spring there, which again is an impact into our environment. So we have to be very careful to have that uh, um, in mind, that, that water is a resource. And um, with all that in mind, global warming, lifting of the ocean levels, water stress, fresh water stress, um, at the end, it comes down that we have poverty, we have crisis, we have tensions, this leads to refugees, and that drives another, uh, another level of crisis. So this is something which is a normal result. If people are hungry, if people are afraid about, about uh, their lives, they typically start uh, uh, fleeing, and that is something which, which adds stress um, and all that to, um, to our communities. So. Now, for a systems engineer, try to put it in some KPIs, try to summarize it in a way that you can start working with that. Um, this is a picture I, I uh, borrowed from, from uh, Professor Friedrich from the University of Braunschweig, and he added another KPI into that where I've not referenced a lot to until now. So what you see here is basically the KPIs for our problems. We have a, we have a population growth, obviously, um, which, which we don't know exactly where it goes to, but is significant. Um, secondly, um, we have greenhouse uh, gases emitted, which foster climate change, which is not a good thing. And we have to be careful the, uh, to, to protect the biodiversity. The Living Planet Index is an index found to, to measure biodiversity. We all know that if you have huge monocultures, this is a bad thing. And it starts very, very small, very little with insects, but it goes and at a certain time point back to humanity. And, and it may lead to diseases. It may may have other effects which you don't see completely and fully right now. So this is the trend, this is the prediction for the future. And now the question is, what, what to do with that? What to do with that? Just accepting it, lay back and say, someone will take care, there are so smart people outside. Is that sufficient? Is that enough? I think there is no doubt about this is not enough. And especially we as, as leading uh, engineers, as highly educated experts, we have, to, we have to be a good example. We have to start moving forward and trying to, to, um, to foster that and to be with that. So, but you have to see it holistically. We are living in a modern world where news are spreading super fast, super quickly. We have social media spreading around uh, um, the, the, the uh, uh, most curious and most strange messages. And sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between is it an opinion or is it a fact? Is it a thought or is it the truth? And even for experts like us, it's not always easy to say, mm, I think it's not that simple, right? And if you now see our customers, the farmers who are in the middle of everything, they are building the fields, they are, they are growing the plants, feeding the world. They should make decisions, helping protecting the environment, helping protecting fresh water. But based on what facts, what is the truth? And it's so easy to get all the messages. If you, if you eat no meat anymore, the planet will heal quickly. You read that in Facebook, whatever. Is it true? Is it real? I don't know. So, so I, I will give you some examples where I say um, you have to be careful with that, and especially also our consumers and our customers have to be careful with that. For example, take electrification of vehicles. Electrification of vehicles is obviously something which can significantly help reducing greenhouse gas emissions. No doubt about that. But only if the energy for charging the batteries, for providing the, the uh, currency for the electric motors is produced greenhouse gas neutral. If I have coal uh, power stations, for example, this may not work easily. So the electric power has to be produced greenhouse gas neutral, and that's not the fact in all countries currently. So there's a lot of work to do also there. The second thing is the nicest battery electric tractor will not be accepted and will not be used in the fields if he is not applicable and, and fulfilling the stakeholder needs of a farmer, according to operating hours, according to charging times, and I have to have a charging network available. And if you see all the discussions about the charging infrastructure for road vehicles, you can imagine what that means for off-road vehicles. 
Would you think that a customer buys a tractor when he has to charge the tractor, drive two and a half hours to the Aldi or Lidl parking spot to charge his tractor? Is that an alternative? Is that something where he can compete with other farmers in Brazil and in Australia who don't worry about that? So it has to be applicable. I don't say that, that you should don't do nothing, but it's teamwork. It's nothing which a manufacturer can solve alone. Another example is I said the power stations for the green, for the electrical vehicles, for the grid uh, connected or battery electric vehicles should be greenhouse gas neutral. Very simple, take biogas stations, right? Biogas stations are greenhouse gas neutral. They use plants and manure, which is already there. The CO2 has been consumed upfront immediately. So in the balance, it could be greenhouse gas neutral. Perfectly true. But again, under some circumstances, the so one thing is, if you don't manage that, um, that uh, biogas stations leak free, you may have an even bigger problem. So, so those, those biogas, does any one of you know how a biogas, biogas station works? Roughly, it's producing methane. It's producing methane. The methane can be burned and can drive a turbine and it produces heat and the heat can be used for uh, heat converters. But the methane is 28 times more greenhouse gas critical than CO2. And there are estimates that farmers who are not always very well educated and not always aware about that risk manipulate that. What you see is the, 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 the roof, the bubble. It's basically a bubble. It's filled with methane. It's methane under certain pressure in it. If you manipulate that, methane may leak out of it. 28 times more severe than CO2. And estimates say that we lose in Germany 300,000 tons of methane by mismanipulations of that gas stations. So if you calculate that by 28, someone good in, in brain calculations? 8.4 million. 8.4 million tons CO2 equivalent, which is exactly the same amount like the whole truck traffic in Germany is doing per year. Just because it's accidentally most probably accidentally mismanaged. Second thing is, if you subsidize plants for that greenhouse gas, um, you reduce biodiversity, but also you produce additional manure. And what you see in the picture on the right is a statistic, an older one, but it shows that the manure out of the biogas plants, the, the amount of manure in Germany increased from 17 to 31% which is meanwhile, the increase is the same size, like exactly. the whole manure from, um, from the livestock, from pig growing. So if you hear about that mass animal herding is bad for water, I can tell you some contribution out of that comes from the biogas stations. So again, green, biogas stations can be a good solution under certain circumstances. Use the manure, which is already there. Take, take waste, which is already there, but don't build extra plants and manipulate it very, very carefully. So last but not least, I, I made that sentence before. It may be a solution to, to stay away from, from uh, animal, uh, eating any animal product, any milk, any beef, any meat. Obviously, yes, growing meat needs a lot of water, uh, produce a lot of CO2. But we have, meanwhile, situations where, for example, um, a Swedish company, Oatly, which grew oats, obviously, to make a, a, a milk replacement product out of that, was so successful that an investment company jumped in, Blackstone. You can read that. It's, it's uh, public. And thought about, mm, if we harvest rainforest, we can produce much more and much cheaper because workforce is cheaper in Brazil. Uh, tractors are cheaper in Brazil and areas available. So they harvested rainforest to grow oats. Then they make oat milk out of that. They put it cooled into containers, into airplanes, and fly it into Europe. And sell it then, and it, is, it should be more CO2 neutral than the milk from your neighbor. So maybe the better solution is drink less milk, buy it at your neighbor farmer and don't fly it in from Brazil. I, I don't know, but just, just the thought, see it holistically. It's not always as simple as it looks like. Uh, other example, you see the picture in the middle is if you grow almonds for almond milk, sometimes in Cali almonds need a lot of water. And um, California has the same problems like Europe. They have a draft and you have to, to pump the water permanently out of the ground. 
For that, you need sometimes diesel pumps, sometimes electrical pumps, and we come back to the thing. Also, those should be operated greenhouse gas neutral. Otherwise, it is not the right calculation. So this is this is just some examples of what I said. There is a lot of opinions. There is a lot of thought around. There is, it's, it's sometimes really hard to get the facts. Our customers, our farmers, they want to, to, to support that. They want to heal the planet, obviously, but they have a, an additional challenge. If you see here numbers out of Germany from the 1950s to today, you see that the um, number of, of farming operations went down or from people um, employed in, in farming operations went down from nearly 5 million in 49 to 580,000 today. So it reduced by the number of 10. This is the number of people engaged in farming business. On the other side, one farmer feed 10 people in 49, but they became so efficient and so effective that meanwhile, they um, they, they increase that by 14 times, nearly 14 times, so one farmer is approximately feeding 140 people today. This is a great news. So we see we can get much, much more efficient with less people, with, with less input, we can get much more output. And our farmers also proved that they can and want to be more ecologically, more environmentally uh, um, sustainable. So uh, again, numbers from Germany, I, I apologize that I don't have from, from Switzerland, but I, I guess they look not very different, maybe even better. Um, what you see in the top picture is the, the area which is operated biologically and ecologically, getting away from, from uh, uh, huge amounts of, of chemicals, going to more mechanical uh, uh, weed operations and all that. And you see this number nearly doubled in the uh, past 10 years, it, it, it went up to uh, more than 10%. And also the um, ecologically operating farm sites, they increased even by nearly factor three from about five to 14%. So our farmers want to be more ecologically, but they have hard times sometimes to figure out how to do that. What is the right way to do that? Um, they have a complex problem highly highly depending on the individual situation of the farmer itself, temporary uh, uh, situations. It is really hard to get all the holistic information. Um, it depends, again, very much on re regional constraints, what is subsidized, what is allowed, what is the laws about that. If you think about the European laws about subsidizing different things, um, you can do an own study on that, I guess, okay? Um, so. And everything is very vulnerable, uncertain. It's very quickly changing. It's, it's complex and it's ambiguous. So the question was, can John Deere help the customers? As our customers, they come to us buying the, the equipment from us. Isn't there more we can do? We have, we have the overview. We are a global operating company, 21 countries. We have agronomic experts. Isn't there more to give to the customers than just only a tractor which needs less fuel? Should be. So, and that was basically that was basically a starting point where we thought about um, when we started 2011, uh, introducing systems engineering as a first initiative and growing. Then um, David said that 2017, I'm in the role as a global systems engineering lead for the tractors. Um, if you if you try to implement systems engineering in a company, you stumble about Conway's law, you stumble about Eppinger's architecture law. And uh, so we reflected that. And uh, for those who are not familiar with Conway's law, Melvin Conway, he said, organizations which design systems, John Deere is obviously one of that, are constrained to produce, to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Unfortunately, this is true. It's not a natural, natural law, it's empirically proven, but if you build if, if, your, if your organization is built that it has an engine department and a transmission department and an operator station department, at the end of the day, your system will be an integration of an engine and transmission and an operator station. It will not a farming system. It will not be a uh, um, tillage system or whatever because tillage was not in the organization. So Epping is saying something different, which unfortunately is also true. If you say, okay, Conway may be true and I want to change, what do I do? If you think about change, obviously you have to change your architecture. And Eppinger said, 
architectural innovations destroy the usefulness of architectural knowledge of established firms. And this destruction is difficult for firms to recognize and to correct. Strange sentence, right? What does it mean? Think about car industry. Car industry has a core architecture of combustion engines. They have architectural knowledge in combustion engines. They have architects, they have experts. So now they want to do innovation. So they want to become electric. So most probably they don't have that deep architectural knowledge about electrical drives than they have in combustion engines. So they have on one hand to grow that knowledge, that architectural innovation and knowledge. But on the other hand, the former experts may be a little bit afraid about their jobs. And they may not immediately and not very visual, not support that trend going to electrification. They may want to do it a little bit more blocking from the, from the soil. So it's hard to recognize and hard to correct. So you have to be aware. If you change, you will have opponents. It will not always be appreciated. It can be destructive. And you have to be aware of that and you have to have measures to correct that. I don't know exactly how it works in detail in, 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 in any other uh, um, domain, but I think John Deere found a good way to, to uh, communicate that clearly and visually and transparent and to overcome also that. So the starting point for John Deere, considering all that, was basically um, we completely changed our view to what we want to do. We don't focus anymore on a tractor and a baler and a combine. We set the focus we want to set is the farming operation with buildings, with people, with animals, with plants, with infrastructures, logistic infrastructures, data infrastructures. That is our system of systems. And in the system of systems, we have as a next decomposition level, we have the production systems. And production systems may be. Um, livestock operation and a small grain operation. So a farmer may have some cows and may grow a little bit of wheat. And he needs different stuff for that. The production system has an own infrastructure, um, logistics, may need machinery, may need people and animals. In this production system, we have then the so-called solution systems, which are basically machinery combinations, a tractor and a trailer, a tractor and a mower. And then we go down, and this is where we come from originally. Then we have on a system layer three, we have the tractor as, as the system of interest where I come from. And this is further decomposed in the in its subsystems, and it goes then down to bolts and washers and lines of executable code. So what does it mean? What, what, what is now the change we really have done in John Deere? So what we did is we changed our organization that we introduced seven production systems in the X site and three in the construction and forestry site. And these are guided and managed by three business units. So our business is not anymore driven by tractors and combines and, and, and balers, but we have a corn and soy production system and a small grain production system and a sugarcane production system. And they try to, to identify economical and ecological headroom for our customers and they drive operations and use cases and needs which are then handed over to the platform systems to the tractors and the balers and all that and they have to build systems which fit into that production system and they don't have to offer systems which at the end of the day may be adopted to serve in production systems the production system is first and it gives the, the requirements and needs to the platform. So this is visualized here. It's also influenced by the different regions. So you may, you may consider that growing corn in the United States is different than in Europe. Um, so there are, inf there are, there are little, little differences. However, the seven production systems um, develop the concept of operations, the capabilities, the measures of effectiveness, which are handed over to the platforms. The platforms have to design by that. The business units shape portfolio and budgets. And depending on the production systems, portfolio and budget is shared between the platforms from a business point of view. My boss boss in that transition, which was initiated by, uh, by John May in 2019 and executed in 2020, took the 
uh, uh, took the chance and reorganized his complete engineering organization for tractors. And what you can see here is in the pillars in the lines, we have now subsystem organizations. That's how our tractor is decomposed, power generation, power transmission, traction and motion control, and they land expert systems engineering, subsystem engineering experts into the vehicle programs, which are the lines. Standard tractor, premium tractor, uh, special tractor for China, for example. So we have, a, we have an organizational cut following our system decomposition of a tractor and very much aligned to the Vs, that we have uh, parts in the organization focusing a lot on our stakeholders and the production systems as an input. We have experts for the implementation and integration, and we also have the experts here for verification and validation. How does it help the farmer? The question, right? So for the farmer, I make an example, a very simple example here. Um, take a dairy and livestock farmer producing milk and producing uh, beef. And um, he is asking himself, that's what I try to visualize on the bottom. He is, is asking himself, how can I be more sustainable? How can I protect the planet? Can, can uh, fight uh, um, global warming and can earn money? Because at the end of the day, he has to be profitable. Otherwise, he will disappear from the market. And he has different ways to do it. He can grow, for example, grass feed and feed his cow with grass. And that may lead to different um, CO2 consumption when the grass is growing and to different um, milk productions and to different methane productions and manure productions from the cows. Or he can go, for example, to a silage feeding with, with uh, corn, corn silage feeding. And maybe then he has also a, a biogas station where he can use the rest of the corn, which is not fed uh, away. So he has different ways to operate his farming operation with the same ground, with the same number of cattle. The question is, what is the right way to do from an economical point of view, from an environmental point of view? So what we do as John Deere in the production system, so the dairy and livestock production system is doing the following. They are investigating from a systems engineering point of view, how is that operation working? What are my inputs? What different variants of my inputs do I have? What are my operations I have to do? How is that process? What is my output out of that system? And in some of that input areas, John Deere is already strong. Some has been identified as a growing opportunity for us, and some are not of that super interest for products and services, but they belong to the system. They have to be considered. Sounds, sounds a little bit academically. Um, I would like to get a little bit more concrete in here. Um, what John Deere is doing with, with our agronomical expertise we have and the knowledge of the different customers in the different locations of the world, how they are doing it. We can, we can very, very uh, um, concrete, very detailed um, predict what do you need to prepare a field for growing grass or growing, um, growing uh, silage food. Um, what is needed for sowing? What is needed for nurturing and protecting? What is needed for harvesting? And we can very easily uh, predict what kind of energy is going in, how much money do you need for that, what agents are used, and so on and so far. And then we also can predict if you have the food stored and you bring it over into the next cycle, what is needed for feeding, nurturing, breeding and raising, how much milk comes out of that, and how much manure comes out of that. And at the end of the day, we can make predictions. Um, if you change something in one of that operations, what impact does it have to the other uh, uh, operations? And systems engineering is, is a very, very powerful method to do that in an, in an abstract and, and, uh, and let's say, uh, averaged way. So, and this can be on one hand as a service provided to the customer, but on the other hand, this already leads to a bunch of, of uh, new ideas and new innovations. And I would like to show you some of that solutions which come out of that restructuring, where you typically, if you talk about John Deere and think about the uh, big green tractors with yellow wheels will not immediately come to, to say, this is really a product you are prof uh, profitable with and which is highly appreciated in the market. But I will show you some examples for that. So one example, and you have seen on my first slide, on the agenda slide, already the picture at the uh, right hand. You may have considered that. One, one uh, a product coming out of the Intelligent Solutions Group is our operation center. The operation center is basically a, a software service, a software tool, which allows a farmer to 
individually track um, on, on, on a two by two centimeter size accurately what he has done on his field at which time and which amount. And you can make very good predictions with that. So what you see, and it runs on, on different, on different uh, platforms and applications. You can have it on your mobile phone, you can have it on your computer, and you have it also in your tractor and in your combine harvest. And what you see here, you see in the picture on the screen of the laptop, you see two, uh, one field and two different views. For example, one view may be um, the uh, yield, uh, at harvest that you see there has been green areas which had a good yield yield and red areas where the yield was below so now the question is what was different and you can for example see in the right picture the amount of um, fertilizer or of uh, um, uh, manure on, on nurturing which you brought there and you see now nah, this is very equally distributed that doesn't explain the red bar in the middle so you can do further investigations out of that the program is guiding you and you may figure out this was too dry or too wet so you may have to drain it or you may have to irrigate it to get the same amount of yield out of it so you can optimize your yield and measuring any task you're doing in the field allows you to make much, much better predictions for the next year to say um, the, the, the seed a little bit deeper into the ground, a little bit less seed, a little bit more seed, this kind of predictions. And at the end of the day, it increases the efficiency. You get more yield out of the square meter. You can feed more people with that. One, one example for our um, solutions coming out of that. Another one is um, if you, if you, uh, operate, um, especially uh, if, you, if you grow plants, um, you have unwanted weeds in between. And the unwanted weeds take water and, um, and, and minerals and uh, um, fertilizer away. So what you want to do is you want to get rid out of uh, that unwanted weeds to, to put all your energy into the wanted weeds. Um, we developed a system which is using cameras at the spray bar and with artificial intelligence in real time, it can distinguish between wanted and unwanted weeds and can reduce the spraying just to the unwanted weeds. This is, this is an, um, let's say this is a uh, uh, marketing picture because typically you will not spray on a an, on an, uh, freshly uh, operated field, but it shows very uh, um, very impressively that the spraying goes really only to that little spots where the unwanted weed is. On one hand, that reduces the amount of spray you need, and spray is really expensive, so it saves a lot of money to the customer. But on the other hand, this makes it, and, and I, I see you, you are laughing, and, and, but at the end of the day, what I said, it has to be applicable, it has to be useful, it's a motivator to do it. Um, on the other hand, if I spray less, less of that chemicals goes into the fresh water. And we can reduce um, in, in typically by 50%, in some cases down to more than 50% the amount of spray for the fields with that. And this is really helpful for the customer. It saves some money, but for the environment also. Another thing is we developed a sensor uh, which was not available on the market, which we call Harvest Lab. And the Harvest Lab can measure, for example, humidity in harvested goods. Oh. Why is that of interest how humid a harvested good is? What, what, is, what, is, what is important for that? I talked about the dairy and livestock farmer. If he decides to feed his cow with silage food, the process of silage compacting is highly depending on how humid is the harvested good. If it is more humid, I need less compaction. If it is drier, I need more compaction at the end of the day. If I harvest that and put it into the trailer, I can basically uh, locally on the part of the trailer tell the guy on the silo how humid that is. So I can tell him drive more frequently over that part from that trailer and less over this from that trailer because it's, it's, it's inhomogeneous, it's heterogeneous. I can control it. Um, and that gives me much better, um, much better results out of my silage feed uh, for the cows and there's much less. Uh, plants, I can produce much more food for the cows. Um, you see here, the picture should visualize um, red is very dry, yellow is not so dry, and green is, is, is good dry. So you see, you can measure that and allocate it also for the operation center for next year to say you should do some draining or something like that. The sensor can do even more and can also measure nitrogen, which means 
if you have um, if you have already measured how much nitrogen in which location of the field is available, you can now control how much manure goes to which square centimeter, because the manure has not an homogeneous nitrogen concentration in it. There are pieces with more nitrogen and with less, and you can control that, and you bring the nitrogen where it is needed by the plants, and it doesn't go into the groundwater. I showed you our prototypes where we are working on battery and cable electric vehicles. Cable electric may sound strange to you. I can refer to that later. We also have a tractor running on vegetable oil as an as an greenhouse gas neutral uh, fuel um, capable to operate in the same manner like a diesel tractor. And obviously, we are going into autonomy um, to, to help also our customers becoming more efficient and to replace human work um, uh, expert work in the fields. So we have already um, for certain applications, tractors and sprayers autonomously running in, in different operations and working obviously to uh, broaden that field where we can do that. So bottom line, I see that I'm, that I'm done and I have only two slides left over is um, this change of the organization, this change of our mindset um, basically is system thinking, not necessarily systems engineering. Systems engineering is then at the end of the day a method applied out of that. But what made us driving into that direction and made us successful here is that we put the stakeholder in the focus. We follow the sentence, form follows, function follows purpose. We put even the purpose on top of that. And we shaped our organization to be capable for systems engineering. We allow our people, our engineers, our experts, our systems engineering teams to iterate, to share their knowledge, need to know it was yesterday. They should share their knowledge. If they make experience, if they make findings, they should share it broadly. Um, they anticipate change. And that may even in a project, that change is something you should appreciate. You should not uh, uh, block it. Um, and if you fail, you should learn. We don't like the sentence, um, fail fast because we don't want to plan to fail, but we fail. And if we fail, we learn out of that and we try to do better next time. And last but not least, it needs, and that is one important thing I have not referred to right now, it needs in your working teams, in your working environment, an, an atmosphere of trust, of respect, and of psychological uh, safety to do that. Everybody should be capable to speak openly up. So in a nutshell, the challenges are huge, but together we can be successful. And we, we believe we believe honestly that if we know each plant and each animal at each time point and what they do and what they need, we can reduce all our loading and wasting uh, agents and, and actions to a minimum. And then we may have on one hand, happy cows and happy plants. And that may at the end, hopefully lead also to a happy planet. So this is a sentence. And we can already maximize output by minimizing input. We are not at the limits here. And systems engineering is core. I promised you, you see a second model in my presentation. I said as a systems engineering presentation, I don't, uh, um, I don't want to, to keep you away of that. So I did my presentation. I, I thank you for your attention. I appreciate your attention. And um, I hope we have a couple of minutes left over, even if I overran a little bit for some questions and answers. Thank you very much. Okay, Christian, thank you very much for, for the interesting presentation. Much appreciated, reminding us that we're living in a system of systems and that we should have um, the entire situation in the mind when we manipulate them. Yeah, let's get to point six and I see Marco is ready to, to shoot, go. <laughs> Yeah, um, very, very interesting. Thanks a lot, uh, especially for our climate track later on. That was a really nice um, primer for that. Um, one question you show that um, the organic farming is going up and the, you know, the farmers really want this. And at the same time, everything becomes more, say, um, technological, you know, how, how is it received by those ecological, you know, eco farmers um, that they now have to work with the robot, basically? 
they, they are typically very open for that. So, so it's highly appreciated. So um, if you do mechanical weed control rather than chemicals, they really like that. So our especially our young farmers are very, very technology open and it's very easy to, to keep them attracted, but they are not stupid and they need good, good arguments and it has to be convincing. And at the end of the day, they have to earn money with that. With everything, what they, what they do, they have to earn money. And there's no problem to introduce that. They are, they are very technology affine. They, they, they jump on it, they learn it very quickly and they demand for more. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, uh, I think it will be a short question, maybe a long one. Uh, do you use model-based engineering also in, in the company or it's not implemented yet? Excellent question. Um, yes and no, okay. yes and no. So we started a while ago and, and I would be brave enough to say it's model-based systems engineering, even if it was um, in the beginning, not tied to a um, modeling language or to a tool. We used basically the concepts of describing a system context, describing concepts of operations um, by models. The models existed partially already in, in formal tools, but also in Visio and PowerPoint. And after it matured so far that our system engineers became used to model context and, and, and boundary diagrams and all that, we are now starting moving over to a formal language and a formal tool for doing that. But it's not the formal language and the formal tool is not implemented. That's a no part of my first answer. Okay. But see, what should I do at the beginning? How do I identify my stakeholders? How do I describe a context? This is a yes part of my answer and we are doing it not very much formal, not tool-based, yeah. So actually that's make the second point of the question that could be the long answer that I was expecting. So in the yes case, how do you deal with the legacy or the old knowledge? Because it's it's very old. I mean, not old in the meaning of old yeah. company, but uh, uh, you have a lot of your, um, your backlog of the knowledge that maybe you could be using in the model based. Absolutely. Uh, so how you digitalize or you take the old information and put it in the modern context. Okay, so, so um, I said we started in 2011 introducing systems engineering as an initiative in the, in the company. We started uh, developing systems engineers and building competency for system engineers uh, uh, 2012, 2013. And, and uh, since a while we have our subsystems um, which are uh, tied to a system engineer. We have clear system engineers for subsystems and they have the task to do exactly that, to describe their system, including legacy, um, in, uh, including all the legacy knowledge and also distinguish between regional legacies which you have. For example, the, the steering system engineer um, has a task up front the project to review the context, the, uh, uh, the use case, the concept of operations, all that, if the legacy can be continued if something has to be changed. And he, he, he is in charge to have that all available for the 40 subsystems we have of a tractor. It's his task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the organization schematic, which I showed you where we have the subsystem organizations. They are led by the business owners of the subsystems and they are responsible for budget, for resource, for priorities, for timing. And this is a base work, the groundwork has to be done. And then we have the lanes, which are the development projects and the subsystem engineers are lent into that with all their knowledge and their modeling. And now we try to transit that from the informal model-based into the formal model-based. Okay, thank you very much. Due to the timing, I think we have to close the session here. Christian is still here the entire day, also in the evening for the APRO. I think more questions can be answered. Yeah. And um, of course, we can then also focus on happiness. <laughs> Therefore, thank you very much. Thank you.